Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with uh, subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value, and then for planning your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's transferable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. Building a business that is transferable or sellable really begins when an owner launches the business uh, with with their eventual goals for exit in mind. Do they indeed want to get value out of the business at some point in the future with a sale to, to either a third party or internal or ESOP? Or do they have vision for uh, eventually transferring the business to children who might be in the business or family members or key employees, if they simply want a lifestyle business while building their desired wealth outside of the business, then building an eventual, uh, for an eventual sale, of course, or transfer might not be necessary. However, we find that most owners do indeed want to get some kind of value out of the business eventually, or either they want to or they need to, and, uh, and, and actually often frequently consider the business to be central to what they would consider to be their retirement plan. And uh, also, we would say that if an owner indeed does build a business that's transferable or sellable, then they're going, to, they're going to have more options for exit eventually. So it can be wise to do that from the very beginning. And uh, so we can work with owners, Walter and his firm, our firm, and together, we can work with owners for years and identifying what aspects of an owner's business, if they focus on it and strengthen it, will increase the value and the sellability or transferability of the business. And, um, and so we want to help them get to a place uh, of readiness themselves personally and their business to where the business is, is ready to be sold or transferred for the value they, they need or that they want. And in, and in doing that, uh, they find it helpful to have us, someone like us, professionals, come in and uh, look under the hood, if you will, and identify any blind spots that they might have in building or accelerating that growth and that business valuation. And so that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about common blind spots in building business value. Our guest is Joe Dufford, and, and Joe is the chairman and senior managing director of JD Merritt. Uh, Joe has over three decades of experience in finance, investment banking, principal investing, corporate strategic planning, he successfully structured, negotiated, and completed over 150 M&A transactions with nearly $4 billion in value, uh, and is actually a M an M&A or an or a M&A um, Advisor Hall of Fame inductee. He's regarded as one of the leading middle market investment bankers in the country, and is highly sought after for his insights on how to gain liquidity and maximize value which we're going to be talking about here today, from private company ownership. He's founded a lot of uh, uh, companies himself, been chaired, he's chaired numerous private companies, and uh, so he's got a lot of experience. He's the type of professional, Joe is the type of professional that we would get involved when a client indeed is going to, that we've worked with him for years, and it's clear that the the transaction is going to be a third-party sale, and they need a professional then to take their readied business to market and get a good transaction from it. And so Joe's the kind of guy that we are, you know, the kind of professional we get involved at that point. So Joe, good morning, and thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Good, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Good morning, Walter. And good morning to the audience. I want to congratulate the uh, all the people listening in today, they have taken the first big step to a successful future, which is to be interested in exit planning. Uh, I had, in addition to my career as an investment banker, uh, the good fortune uh, when I started my firm 30 years ago to have partnered with uh, a transactional attorney, uh, as well as an estate planning attorney by the name of John Brown. 
Uh, John Brown is a, uh, well regarded as the sort of the founder of exit planning. Uh, I was fortunate to contribute to his book, How to Run Your Business So You Can Leave It in Style, The Seven-Step Exit Planning Process. Uh, and so like, uh, unlike many other investment bankers, I really do understand and appreciate uh, the unique value that goes into getting the business ready for sale, working with uh, you know, professionals such as Pat and Walter to uh, focus on your long-term exit objectives. So uh, congratulations to all of you for listening in today and thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Hey Joe, that's really, uh, that's really interesting. I didn't know you had a connection with John Brown. That's, that's really cool. Um, yeah. let me ask you a question. So a lot of the businesses that Pat and I work with are, you know, between five and $20 million in revenue. And I would say probably the biggest issue we see as far as a value in a transferable value impediment especially near the low end of that scale is that the business is way too centered on the owner. Has that been your experience also? And what do you, what would you say about that? Well, certainly uh, in, in the five to $20 million range of value, it's, it's an entrepreneurial led business. Uh, it's often a lifestyle business that uh, is not seeking to be a transferable value there. Uh, they're seeking to you know live well out of it and then, and then hope that someday somebody will buy it from them or they'll have enough wealth, they can close it down. But I, I completely agree that if a business is going to be transferred to a third party, there typically needs to be, you know, a team beyond the owner. And, you know, having a team beyond the owner uh, does a lot of things. One, it allows the business owner to work on the business versus in the business. And it also has a uh, transferability that allows the business owner to exit shortly after they sell a company. Uh, so yeah, I was meeting with a client yesterday in uh, Arkansas and uh, two, you know, two fine gentlemen that started their business uh, when they're in their thirties, they're now both approaching 60. Uh, one of their partners uh, recently, you know, exited and sold his shares back to them. And that got them thinking, well, you know, who are the young guys that are going to, we're going to be able to sell our shares to. And they realize that they don't really have the young guys that they can sell their shares to. And, and that uh, they have been very, very much involved in the day-to-day -day selling of the services and selling of uh, the products and the engineering that goes along with the uh, sales and service in their particular business. So uh, we're working with them to help them uh, develop a succession plan uh, as well as, you know, fortunately for them, they've been approached by, a couple of uh, businesses that are owned by private equity uh, that have, you know, senior management in place and they're looking for them to be an add-on acquisition uh, so that they'll work for three to five years and, and, and then move on to other things, uh, which might, might be a solution for their uh, too much centered on themselves. And it, it, it wasn't, you know, certainly intentionally centered on themselves. It just oftentimes in the five to $20 million range, it's just how things go. Uh, yeah. Business owners are, you know, entrepreneurs are a unique breed, and uh, they are uh, drivers, and they are uh, much more committed to the success of the business than almost anybody else that they, they can bring around them. Uh, and that if they don't have uh, good advisors uh, such as yourself and Pat to, you know, build uh, management incentive programs and to find ways to attract and retain and develop the, the next generation. You know, by default, they're going to end up either shutting the business down or getting less for it than they might otherwise get in a sale or being an add-on to somebody else's, you know, bigger platform. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point that you make is, you know, I think because exit planning is what Pat and I do for a living, we can have the false assumption that everybody wants to grow their business and sell it. But, you know, I have a lot of clients who it's really interesting, um, especially if they're, you know, service businesses. They make so much money that selling their business, they're going to take a cut in pay. So they're really better off just continuing to grind it out for an extra three or four years. That's as much as they're going to get for selling it. And they won't have all the headaches and everything. So it's Well, I, I certainly understand that. We One of the... You know, one of the tenets of exit planning is 
to know what your your what your number is in terms of what's going to take for you to retire. Sort of step one is you know, your planning and your objectives. Uh, and oftentimes business owners say, well, you know, I, I need to make, you know, $300,000 a year because that's my lifestyle. And then they sort of do the reverse math into what the business has to be worth. And sometimes it's not worth that. And they, you know, they're sort of left with no other choice than to, to keep working because the, you know, the, the plan didn't work out. Uh, you know, fortunately we're, you know, fortunately I say we're in a rising yield environment so that, uh, if somebody can sell their business and actually deploy it into relatively safe investments and get it, you know, somewhat decent return on on that uh, that money for the last, you know, for the last decade, it's been you know you know one or two percent in uh, in treasuries, and you know, that's not enough to replace a lifestyle uh, cash flow for most yeah. business owners. So fortunately, we're we're going to probably be five percent in treasury yields, which well, you know, once you have a liquidity event, will be good. The downside of it is when interest rates rise, values yeah. decline. Uh, so it's a double-edged mm -hmm. sword. Yeah. So, so Joe, um, blind spots. Let's talk about blind spots that you and 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 particularly interested in in the perspective of someone like you who actually do the trans do transactions which we don't do we don't do the transactions we help them get to the business get their business to the place where you know you would have a a solid product to take to market and um so we're really interested in knowing what you what what the blind spots are that you've identified and 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 see frequently well i'll i'll start with you know there's you know the there's lots of lots of different types of blind spots uh, that happen in the middle market, but I'll try to focus on sort of four or five that are are fairly commonplace and that we can delve into in greater detail. Uh, I think the ver the first one is you know fail failure to have an exit plan, uh, failure to actually understand what their objective is with the business. Sometimes, you know, oftentimes entrepreneurs, people who start businesses, are uh, you know they're go getters, they're entrepreneurial, they're sales focused. Uh, people and and they're uh, you know they're out driving their business and they think it'll all just work out uh, because entrepreneurs have this tendency to believe that tomorrow will be better than today because if they didn't believe that they wouldn't be entrepreneurs so they'll have the assumption that uh, it'll all work out uh, and therefore they fail to have an exit plan uh, they also fail to have estate plans which is part of uh, the exit planning process but uh, you know I, I firmly believe that the biggest blind spot is not really having a roadmap. Um, and, you know, the seven step exit planning process, know your objectives. You know, number two, uh, understand where you are relative to those objectives, business valuation. Uh, if you are, are looking to build your business, you know, what are your programs and procedures for attracting, retaining, and developing the next generation? You know, if you, if your hope and desire is to transfer the business to your management team or your children, uh, and sometimes those children are, are in grade school or not even born yet when people start their businesses and they hope that one day, you know, their, their kids are going to want it, you know, so what's, what's the plan for developing that next generation? Uh, they don't have a contingency plan, which is, you know, what happens if you're suddenly not around to, to help run your business and make, make decisions. Sometimes, you know, bad things unexpectedly happen and they don't have that, that uh, contingency plan. Uh, and then they don't know anything about the process of selling to a third party, and they don't know what third party buyers are lo looking for. Uh, so they they don't build a business towards that end. Uh, I'm a firm believer that a business owner should be planning for the day they sell their business on the day they start it, even if they never plan to sell it. Because if they build it to sell it, they'll build a much better business. It'll be a better business from a lifestyle standpoint because they'll have you know key people in place that'll enable them at some point in time to spend more time doing you know things that are of interest to them whether it's golfing tennis travel charity work uh you can't do that if you have to work in the business every day so uh having an exit plan and building your business as if you're going to sell it is one of the most important things you should do and it's the biggest blind spot particularly in the lower middle market where people, you know, just hope it's going to all work out. 
Yeah, you know, I, let me follow up on that one real quick. Um, first off, you know, if you if you, I, I like the point you made about you're going to enjoy life. These are my words, but basically what you said: enjoy life in the business uh, if you're go, if you build it to sell it, um, because you have more freedom. Uh, if you look at our tagline on our on our website, it says "Enjoy life in the business, plan for life after the business." The enjoy life in the business comes if indeed you do build a business that's transferable. Uh, but in regard to the exit plan, of course, <laughs> we we absolutely believe and have the same convictions that you do, that you just communi commun communicated there, because that's what we do. Um, we were certified by John Brown and his, and his organization as exit planners, as you were. Um, what, how do you see it, imp what impact does a lack of planning have when you're actually at the deal table with a owner who wants to sell? Well, I'll give you just a real recent example. We, we, uh, we sold a business last week uh, in the uh, uh, jewelry wholesale business. Uh, very fine company had been in business for about 50 years, uh, run by a, a husband and wife team, uh, very hands-on. Uh, they initially thought their sons would like to take over the business. Um, but, you know, the, after a decade or so working, you know, in the business for mom and dad, both of their sons said, eh, this isn't what we really want to do with our lives. And they went out and pursued their own interests. Uh, so uh, rather than build a team around them, mom and dad just kept on keep uh, keeping on. Uh, and they built they built a really fine reputation uh, in the marketplace, they built a uh, a fine uh, a fine business uh, that we were ultimately able to sell to a strategic buyer. Uh, but they really had no option other than selling to a strategic buyer. There was no other you know tier two management. There was no future CEO or president in the business. Uh, and and they'll play into my second point, which is lack of financial reporting. You know, they didn't have you know good financial people in the organization, so they left money on the table. We, we got a great outcome for them, but mm -hmm. it took a lot longer to do. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they they did leave money on the table by not having this uh, successor in place. And uh, probably mo most importantly, their their plan was that the business would continue as an independent business in perpetuity. Uh, and not ever be folded into anybody else's business. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, they didn't build the team to allow that to happen. So the business is now part of another organization. The brand will continue, but a lot of the folks that worked there were displaced and and the company will be operating in a different form going forward and not, not quite the vision that they had in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that we've heard from transaction people is that if, 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 um, uh, an owner has not planned the way you so eloquently de um, described a few minutes ago that we we actually help people do that when they get to the deal table, oftentimes that's when they start to th think about what their goals are at, actually at the deal table. And then, of course, when that starts to happen, well, everybody gets it, it gets uh, goes sideways and. And that's when well, deals it, blow up a lot of times. Have you experienced that oh, once yeah, or twice? It's actually, well, one of the first things we do in accepting clients is we have them complete an exit readiness survey. Uh, because if they are if they haven't uh, asked and answered a series of questions of themselves, like, you know, why are they wanting to sell and what's their plan afterwards? And, you mm -hmm. know, do they have a, a mission or passion uh, beyond the business? Uh, you know, do they uh, do they know what their number is? Uh, a lot of those kinds of things. If they can't answer those questions, we often won't take them on as a client. Uh -huh. Okay. Because we yep. know that one of the first conversations they're going to have with a buyer, and the buyer is going to ask them, "So, uh, you know, Joe, why are you here? Why why do you want to sell your business?" And it's like, well, you know, it's just that time I'm old, and you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just not really an adequate uh, answer. And if they, if that, it is the answer, the buyer will immediately know, okay, we have somebody who's aged out and, uh, you know, we can buy the company for a lower price. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my experience is that people sell a company for, for one of three primary reasons. One, 
um, they they run out of time. So in the case of our our jewelry wholesaler, he was 80 years old. He just kind of ran out of time. He was still very passionate for the business, loved the business, but at some point in time, you just have to call it quits. Mm -hmm. uh, so they run out of time. Uh, the other is they run out of resource. They either run out of capital or they run out of the ability to hire the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, their technology becomes obsolete and they can't reinvest in, in the technology for whatever reason. Uh, so they, they run out of resource and therefore they want to sell to somebody with greater resources. Um, and third and, and fairly common in, in the middle market is, you know, they run out of interest. I mean, there's only so many years you want to do the same thing. Um, and entrepreneurs by definition are creative mm -hmm. and they want to experiment with other things and they get bored. Uh, right. So they choose to sell the business to go pursue other interests as the uh, s saying goes. So, it, you know. Okay. Uh, okay. So you were going <laughs> to, you were going to give us four blind spots and, and I've just got us through with all my drill down questionings through one. What's number two? Huh, number two. Um, they underinvest in financial reporting. Uh, they don't understand the, the importance of having uh, audited financial statements or at least reviewed financial statements. Uh, oftentimes, business owners are their sales oriented folks, and they understand that hey, if I if I have a sale with a customer and they pay me, that's a good thing, right? And if I can get supplies at a decent price and I can afford to pay for them, that's a good thing. And as long as I can manage the cash flow. That's all I really need to know. And coming back to my you know, uh, recent client, he had a, a, he had a great uh, inventory management system. Uh, he had a good receivables management system, uh, an adequate payables system. None of them interacted with the general ledger and getting accurate financial reporting was nearly impossible. Uh, they, only, uh, they only updated their, their GL once a year when they did an inventory count. And uh, their CPA would come in and do a compilation. Uh, and, you know, basically throughout the year, they didn't have any idea about what their their true margins were or what their true, you know, working capital requirements were. And uh, so they, they had underinvested. And that's not atypical. It's very common of middle market business owners, particularly in that, you know, 5 million revenue or, or less. You know, they just don't appreciate the value of having a good controller and good financial reporting uh, systems. So uh, it's a, it's a blind spot because when you go to sell the company, the, you know, the, one of the first things an investment banker, business broker, M&A advisor is going to ask you for is, you know, what's your EBITDA? What's your revenue? What's your EBITDA? You know, what's EBITDA? That's often a question, that, you know, answer we get back, what's EBITDA? Um, and so earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization is uh, only, you're only going to be able to determine that if you have accurate financial statements. So uh, I, this is a plug to my my colleagues in the CPA world that, you know, an audit is an investment in the value of your business. Even if you don't owe the bank money and you don't have anybody else asking for an audited financial statements, at least three to five years before you're thinking about selling it, you should have your financial statements audited. Uh, in every transaction, you're going to be asked to make a representation that your financial statements are prepared in, uh, you know, some form of generally accepted accounting principle, uh, and you can't make that statement if you don't have ad adequate uh, financial reporting and a good uh, CPA. So I encourage people to, you know, invest in uh, qualified controllers, CFOs. Uh, meeting yesterday with uh, with a client, and and they had recently hired a CFO about two years ago, and the three partners, only one of them wanted to hire the CFO. The other two thought, what do we need to hire an expensive CFO for? Heck, he's going to cost us more money than we pay ourselves. And, uh, uh, but in hindsight, uh, you know, they admitted that he saved them a half a million dollars in his first six months on the job. And they would more, more than paid for his compensation just within six months. Uh, and that is finding good things every day that, improve their margins, lower their operating costs, and better manage their cash flow so that they can take larger distributions out of the business. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point, Joe. So I think that's pretty much the position Pat and I take is that at least three to five years out, I usually have them start with a review and then work into work into the audit. Um, and, you know, like, like you said, a lot of clients look at that as kind of a 
kind of throwing money away. But I think in the long run, especially in a sale transaction, it, it really pays off. It, it certainly does. And if, if you don't do an audit uh, before you go to market, you're gonna your investment banker is going to ask you to invest in a quality of earnings, a sell side Q of E. Uh, I actually got into the deal business when I worked at Deloitte Haskins and Sells years ago and was representing people like, you know, KKR and Tom, Thomas Lee, uh, you know, a lot of the big private equity companies uh, in the day. And, you know, my job was to go in and do a quality of earnings after the letter of intent had been signed. And if we couldn't shave 10 or 15% off the purchase price, we didn't think we'd done our job. Right. Uh, there's always ways to reduce purchase price if you don't have reliable financial statements as a starting yeah. point. Yeah. And private equity buyers know that. So every transaction, whether it's a every private equity transaction, there'll be a quality of earnings done by the buyer. Uh, in order to protect yourself and to maximize your value, you should either have an audit or do a sell side QV prior to going to market. That's excellent. And let's be clear, we're not paying you to say any of this stuff, right, Joe? No, I don't think I've even got a cup of coffee out of this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That we'll was send so you a Starbucks gift card. Yeah. Oh, good. That'd be great. You know, when, when, I was induct, when I was inducted into the M&A Advisor mm -hmm. Hall of Fame in November, uh, I was really hoping it came with a Starbucks gift card. And I'm still waiting for that, too. So yeah, I'll, I'll send you my address. All right. So, Joe, OK, well, we may, we may jack it up a little bit. The amount of uh, depending what, on what your third blind spot is, what's number three? Um, no, number three is uh, not understanding the value drivers of the business and the things mm -hmm. that buyers are really going to focus on. And, you mm -hmm. know, some examples of that would be, you know, customer concentration. You know, mm -hmm. some sometimes you get a customer. One what, what of my favorite stories is when Vizio uh, was starting their business, uh, they, you know, they came to Walmart and said, you know, we'd like you to buy our TVs, they're high quality, they're lower price, we make them in China, and it's going to be a great thing. And Walmart said, that's great, as long as we're the only ones that can sell them mm -hmm. for the first, you know, five years or whatever. Right. So, you know, the, the people that own Vizio made a lot of money uh, working with Walmart in that partnership, but the ability to transfer that business with a single customer that could change their mind at any given day, uh -huh. uh, it reduces value. Uh, also, a lot of the you know the the, the fulfillment by Amazon uh, companies that are out there these days, uh, you know they you know their primary customer is you know whoever Amazon's customers are, but they have to play by Amazon's rules of the road, and if they ever mm -hmm. violate a rule of the Amazon ecosystem, Amazon just turns them off which makes their business, you know, essentially worthless. And, you know, a lot of business buyers know that risk and uh, they are, are going to pay attention to, do you have more of a diversified revenue stream? So a diversified uh, customer base is more valuable than a concentrated customer base. Uh, the same thing goes for supply chain and vendor concentration. Uh, I think all the automotive companies in America learned very uh, hard lesson here in the last couple of years that if your supply chain is concentrated in uh, you know a single channel and you can't get your chipsets, you can't build the rest of the product. So it's you know can be you know assessing your vendor concentrations by key component and having an alternative strategy is another uh, thing that a lot of business small businesses don't have the luxury of doing, but it's a it's a key variable in, in mitigating your vendor concentration. Uh, you know key people concentration oftentimes in you know, middle market companies, they'll be, you know, uh, you know, the the great sales guy or the great sales gal. I had a had a client a few years ago that about a forty million dollar, fifty million dollar business, except for one other account was a another fifty million in revenue, so a hundred million all in. But that other fifty million was controlled by a single salesperson who had developed a relationship year over year over year. Uh, and then that that uh, cust uh, that salesperson retired, and the customer decided to put the business out to bid, and it went to a different vendor. Uh, so they lost half their business simply because they had a, a retirement from a key employee. So uh, managing your key employee risks or salesperson risk mm -hmm. also is a blind spot that often gets overlooked. Um, and then, uh, hey Joe, can I can I follow up on that one? Yes, sir. 
you know, there's a lot of talk out there about um, the evil non-compete agreements. Isn't that going to have a dramatic effect on value if you literally could not have non-compete agreements with people? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it always amazes me how people have these great ideas and they just don't, they're just totally unaware of the ramifications of them. Yeah. So I think what's going to change, the, the, the market's going to change a bit. The non-competes are probably going to be legislated out of existence, but non-circumvention agreements will still be probably allowed, which will be, you're free to go make a living across the street, but you're not free to take my customers and my other employees and my trade secrets and all of those sorts of things. So you know, go with God and, and compete across the street. But if you ever touch one of our customers, we have an agreement that says you aren't going to do that for a period of time and we will enforce it. Uh, so I think yeah, non and the, non the non competes would still, I mean, I mean, this would, are they talking about legislating the, the non competes in sale transactions as well? Uh, because well, I, I, I don't think so. I think what they're relating to, uh, what the legislature and what President Biden spoke about last night during the State of the Union was, you know, non competes for employees mm -hmm. uh, that everybody right. has to sign a non compete and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, secrecy act or agreement uh so i think that the the restriction on people's right to you know be employed um will mm -hmm. is going to go away uh with respect to a sales transaction if you're a if you're a shareholder and you're benefiting from a transaction even if you're a minority shareholder uh you're likely going to have a non-compete and that's likely going to still be enforceable because it was mm -hmm. part and parcel of a transaction where you received meaningful consideration. The problem with employee non-competes is there's really no meaningful consideration other than the right to work. Well, they have the right to work anywhere they choose. And, and that's the fundamental thing that's going to, that's going to be changed. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think we're going to see more and more business owners focusing on having non-circumvention agreements and trade secrets agreements and uh, invention agreements, uh, all of which will still be enforceable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Joe, uh, right now we've got the blind spots being, of course, failure to having a comprehensive exit plan, uh, number one. Number two, the importance, understanding the importance of um, uh, financial reporting, quality financial reporting, at least reviewed, if not audited. Audited is recommended at least for three to five years prior to to sale. And then number three, of course, not understanding, not being clear on the value drivers. And you've listed the two, a few there, a few key ones. There are others. But let's get into number four. What's your number four blind spot? Um, you know, number number four, I'm gonna I'm gonna say is uh not understanding uh, their business model and what is creating value in their business model. Um so you know business that have recurring revenue, uh, such mm -hmm. as a, a software as a service business, those businesses will trade typically on a multiple of revenue. Now, there are key metrics for SaaS companies in terms of rate of growth, total addressable market size, margins, uh, those mm -hmm. sort of things that play into what that multiple is. But you know, not understanding that if you have a component of your business that's repeatable and scalable, uh, is more valuable. So in the case of a CPA firm, the tax practice is, you know, typically, you know, very stable clients are coming back every year. It's predictable. It may not be contractual, but it's very predictable. Same thing with, you know, large audit clients for the most part, you know, if you're doing audits for public companies, you know, they're not going to go away and <laughs> you can charge them a lot. And then, you know, so that's a more valuable business than a, say a consulting business, that is out looking for an opportunity, captures that opportunity, does the work, and then you're done, right? So having repeatable and uh, uh, recurring revenue is is more valuable than just a one-off. Uh, in the in the business I met with yesterday, you know, they started out as an engineering firm. They sold design, you know, designs that other people would build, and then they evolved into design build. So they got manufacturing, uh, but they were living feast, you know, feast and famine and deal by deal. Uh, and then they said, well, you know, we got to smooth this out. Maybe we put some services in there. 
and we will service the products that we make and we'll sign service contracts that you know people will you know sign up to when they buy our product for a year or two and and then they'll hopefully continue those going going on and that developed into a business that you know has you know MRO services where they're you know they've got engineering talent and service people embedded in manufacturing companies throughout the US and those people get paid you know every month and it's you know lasts for years uh, which enabled them to have more stable cash flow so they could develop more proprietary products and built a business uh, by changing the model right so if uh, if you don't understand your business model and and how you're creating value that's a blind spot and it's, a, it's an area that is easily identifiable if you seek the help of good exit planning professionals who can, you know, sometimes when you're working in the business, you have no idea what the business looks like from the outside. So bring, you know, bring in, you know, outside professionals to help you assess that or join a Vistage group or YPO group or chief executive network is one I like a lot uh, and, and be around peers that can help you think about your business model and, and your you know, how you're creating value for the next generation. Excellent. Yeah, so uh, 40 minutes is going by quick. Uh, Walter's going to wrap us up here in a second. But just again, to summarize those four blind spots, because they're not insignificant. And actually, if you listen to this podcast, you'll, you'll hear these blind spots over and over and over. But have a comprehensive plan. Um, there's many benefits to it. You don't want to get to a deal table and not have, it, have that done and completed, have your goals clarified, know what you need, know where you're going. So a comprehensive plan, that's a blind spot. Um, uh, underestimating the importance of, of audited uh, financial statements, quality financial reporting. Number three was understanding value drivers. What are the drivers of value for your particular business? Don't be blind to those things, but understand them clearly so that you can work on them over time to strengthen them and um, increase the value of your business. And then lastly, number four was being clear on your model, your business model and how it would be valued. Uh, the, 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 the very fine example is the one uh, uh, Joe gave uh, referring to recurring revenue and how that can just really have a massive difference. Recurring revenue, that that model can have a massive difference on your on your valuation. So so Walter, um, I think you're going to go ahead and okay. take us to the end here. Great. Joe, thanks for joining us. I think this has been really good. I'm sure that uh, I know Pat and I enjoyed it and learned a lot, and I'm sure our listeners did as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, sort of in, in a final closing comment, um, the biggest thing that will help you or hurt you is whether you're prepared for the unexpected. That mm -hmm. knock on the door where somebody wants to buy your company, mm -hmm. that's not the time to get prepared. That's the time to be prepared, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the uh, you know, the black swan event that hits your industry uh, that mm -hmm. you didn't anticipate, but you, if you were planning for contingencies, you're going to weather the storm. So planning and thinking about the unimaginable or the best case scenarios are a great way to invest your weekend time. If you're busy working in the business, take some time to work on the business. Uh, and if you'd like to, you know, continue the conversation with me, you can find me uh, on LinkedIn. Joseph Dernford uh, is my uh, technical name on LinkedIn, or you can find me on our website, jdmerritt.com. Uh, you can schedule a, a meeting, uh, uh, discovery meeting to talk about some of your issues. Uh, and again, I encourage you to stay tuned in to this, this podcast. Uh, you'll get lots of great value from Joe and Walter and their other guests. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to be on today. Thank yeah, you very much. Hey, Joe, you're Joe. I'm Pat. Well, that's okay. You called him John. <laughs> I know. I know. I called Joe John. Oh, I was actually thinking that your son was the talent. <laughs> well, and he is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. C contact, contact Pat for the uh, color commentary. Yeah, listeners, we really do know each other. <laughs> yeah, really. And we, and we know our, we know our names. <laughs> 
And listeners, if you want help in building a transferable business or planning for your exit, you can reach out at grfcpa.com, nslp.com, or exitreadiness.com. Also, if you set up a free account on exitreadiness.com, you'll receive a 10% discount on any products purchased if you use the code podcast. Until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Walter Dial and Pat Ennis signing off.